Right, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, global population, Sam Fisher here. Say hello, Will. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back, yeah. To another new episode. Uh, <laughs> right. Let's, um... Oh, look at Dad, Dad, Dad. What? There's no festival. Oh, yeah, the festival's finished, hasn't it? They had a music festival in the middle of town. Anyway, beside the point. Let's take another look at Pfizer, shall we? It's been a while since I've, I've done one of these on the Pfizer dock, but the last last release were massive. In fact, this month is huge as well, absolutely huge. Last month there was about about 100 PDF files, a lot of them thousands and thousands of pages long. Um, I just want to make a special thank you to, to Bob and Kate from Telegram who really helped me out with these, looking through them because I really did need some help, really did need some help <laughs> um, <clears throat> maybe that I'll, I'll need the help again with the rest of these ones but what was in them? well Mostly they were to toxicology reports, in fact the, the vast majority of them were toxicology reports and also inserts of the vaccines, uh, PDFs of the inserts that they put in with them. Um, but it's the tox reports that we, I think we should take a look at, or we should have taken a look at, which is what we did. You see that these were surprising in and of itself because as far as we knew they didn't do any when asked by the EU Parliament if there were any uh, safety studies to determine transmission or anything like that the Pfizer representative that they were speaking to turned around and said no so it was quite surprising to see a <laughs> toxicology report about transmission in those in those anyway so yeah that was a surprise what was in them well there wasn't a lot really apart from the fact that <clears throat> the majority of animals that they used were very few and far between There was the eight mice, the famous eight mice. <laughs> there was also macaques, macaque monkeys. There's only about 15 or 20 of those. Ferrets, there's only about 10 of those at the very least. Very more, sorry. So they didn't really do a lot of testing on them, to be perfectly honest. But it was also what they were looking for. Or what they were using to gauge their success, if you will, or failure. Incidentally, it was, to them, it was success. You see, when you have a, a, an immune response, human body, there are two different types of antibodies that are produced. or one if it's a novel virus, right? Now these animals would, had already been sort of um, exposed to this, um, to this virus by the very, <laughs> very act of giving them the virus and then putting the spike protein in. And see, if, you, if they'd just injected them with the spike protein, that would have been fine. It would have come up. There would, there would have been a certain type of antibodies whose name I forgot, I'll put it across the bottom, that would have been released, that were released, sorry, uh, whenever it's a new sort of organism or a pathogen that they, that they encounter. But there's also another type. 
and this is these these antibodies are linked to your immune or memory in other words the actual um, the actual foundation of your, of your immune system this is what remembers what pathogens you've already been exposed to and these are permanent no matter what anyone says to the contrary in the mainstream media they're lying these are permanent they become a permanent part of you of your immune system now you only get these usually through a natural sort of encounter with that organism or that pathogen but it, your body can be tricked by a vaccine if it's using say um, an, what they call an attenuated virus which is ba basically it's either it's, a, it's either a dead virus or it's it's severely weakened and hampered and they do this various ways um, drowning it in chemicals like bleach or what have you In these reports, and thank you Bob, thank you Kate, because you both confirmed something that I'd already seen myself. It just confirmed, confirmed it even more. They weren't even looking for this. They sort of glossed over it whenever they, uh, whenever they mentioned it, because it was tiny, it was so low, it was pretty much insignificant. And this was down to the mRNA vaccine itself, the, well, the spike that it's supposed to produce, actually shutting off that that side, that sort of part of your immune response. So all you were getting were the temporary antibodies that flooded the systems. Far greater than what was necessary, basically, or what was expected. And this was a, a common thing, immune response wise, and it's been seen in humans as well. This is extremely problematic. The reason being is because those temporary antibodies, because they've, they've been sort of produced in such high, high quantity, it can cause um, a sort of immune fatigue far quicker because it, the next time it it, it, it can only it, could, it produces far less and it keeps on getting progressively far, lesser and lesser. All at the same time as this is sort of blocking your usual um, immune or memory response. Um, Your immune system has got countless different sort of aspects to it. Um, lots of you have heard of white blood cells. Well, what, what, white blood cells is just a sort of um, a a folder, if you will, a, folder, a file folder, if you will, for several different types of cells in your immune system. You get your T cells, which are basically what people think of as as your white blood cells as your soldiers but you also get um killer t cells yeah these are called lymphocyte cells by the way right your, your killer t your killer lymphocytes are the ones that actually go in and will attack a virus or a pathogen or whatever they will also destroy cells if the need if the need is required um if say the the regular re immune response can't actually destroy the virus that's inside the body then it will destroy the cells that the virus is being produced in okay whenever whenever you you're infected by a virus what it actually does is it is it gets into your nucleus of your cell and it begins to turn that into a virus factory and that what what that means is that that cell will then produce 
hundreds of thousands of virus, yeah, new viruses, and then die and flood the system with the rest of them. So what the killer T cells do is they basically eat that cell, destroy that cell. You also get your B and your, your C lymphocytes. Now these are, um, these are what your actual memory is, yeah? Um, they're sometimes called macrophages, yeah, or macrophages. Um, and what these do is they will, they serve two purposes. The first is to detect a certain uh, marker that's on a cell. Yeah? That whenever whenever a, cell, a virus invades that cell, it will leave a chemical marker, right? which is basically what the spike protein was thought to be. What your, what your B and C lymphocytes and all your macrophages will then do is then they will find that, they will detect that on the cell, they will take sort of a, a sample of it, detect whether they know what, whether they've seen it before, and then trigger the appropriate response. This will either be um, from uh, your C cells, which are your other, your basically your, they like T cells only, they're more to do with your immuno memory. Yeah, they're attack dogs for the immuno memory. They, they actually still have it stored, still have that marker and the um, required response still stored inside that cell. Um, if they've never, if they've not encountered it before, then they will go back to either, either your bone marrow or your liver or wherever, wherever they've come from. There's several areas in, like in your body where. Um, your, your white white blood cells are generated, but they'll go they'll go back to there and they will basically store that information and stay there. That'll be it. Yeah, they'll store that information ready for the next time it gets um, it gets detected. Yeah. Now, if it's part of your immune system's long term memory, you will be seeing a lot less. Of the, uh, you'll be seeing a far, in fact, far, far, far more significantly less number, right, or lower number of these antibodies than you would with the temporary ones, simply because it's seen it before, it knows what to attack it with, knows where to attack it, and blah blah blah, right. And that's the bit that you want. That's what you want in in any sort of immune response. You you want it to be as long term as possible. Which is something these spike proteins, these um, mRNA jabs weren't doing. Yeah, they weren't triggering that long-term response, or in fact, triggering the immune or memory at all. Now this begs the question: Why weren't they? What was it about the mRNA? that was preventing this from happening. The only thing I could think of is something I've been investigating for a long while, for a long while, even since before these, these jabs came into effect. As soon as they said they were gonna use mRNA, I started looking in a certain direction. You see these these mRNA <coughs> strands, yeah, these sequences are exactly the same as a CRISPR gene editor, yeah. And of those, there's loads of different types. They can only become a CRISPR gene editor once they reach an area like the liver or somewhere anywhere that has a sort of regeneration regenerate cells, basically, yeah. Which is why they go to the skin, they go to the veins. Now, if that's the case, they knew this when they actually started injecting people with it. It was intentional, but they were injecting people deliberately with a gene editor. 
because they knew that it would leave the actual injection site and travel through the body to either to the liver or the testes or something like that. What? Okay, come on. And of course they did. You already knew this anyway. There was a <coughs> there was a meeting at MIT, the uh, medical research department of MIT in, in the US. I think around 2016. Oh no, 2020. Sorry, early 2020, when they were already speaking quite openly about concerns with with the mRNA technology. And it leaving the leaving the injection site and heading straight for these areas where it would be integrated into the DNA, it'd be transcribed over. The process is called reverse transcription. It's basically how your, your body does it naturally, anyway. Whenever it finds a, an imperfection or an impurity in your DNA strand, it will. It causes the body to produce this little mRNA, mRNA um, sequence that will be reverse transcribed over to your DNA and it will get rid of those imperfections or impurities. To do this it needs, it needs a certain enzyme, um, C5, called, which is basically a, um, it's a reverse transcription enzyme. Okay? That's what it is. Reverse transcriptase it's called. Now most people who have sat there and I've had conversations with who are kind of sort of knowledgeable about this. He turned around and said, but you can't, you can't, you can't get transferred into your DNA because it doesn't have reverse transcriptase in the, in the, in the vaccines. <laughs> yeah, doesn't matter. Turns out the body actually automatically and quite naturally, <clears throat> as soon as it detects an mRNA strand in, in that area will automatically produce reverse transcriptase anyway. They will do it naturally and naturally incorporate it into the DNA. And they knew this. They knew it did this six hours after the injections. They've known this for a long while. <clears throat> Which brings me to something else. And this is likely the reason for these shots in the first place. This is just speculation, all right? But it's speculation born from certain very credible criteria. All of this, all the documents, I will leave in the description below, right? But this is important. 2013, there was a US Supreme Court decision well, a hearing, and it was on cloning, human cloning, and cloning in general, and genetic engineering, and the matters to do with patents, uh, owners of patents, and owner ownership rights. Part of that was to do with humans. And so I said, if a human is gen genetically modified, can it still be classed as human? And the US Supreme Court said no. said no 2013 if you are genetically modified by any sort of gene product you are then a, a product of that company now there are mitigated circumstances say like you didn't know and blah, blah 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 right but any children that that human being then has right any any of their progeny are then automatically a product owned by the company that basically did the modification because then they're an originator of that product. They're the first in that line, in that product line. The person, the person who originally had the modification done to them could be considered maybe a, a prototype, yeah? But anything after that are the first line in that product. Now, This very idea, although yet to do with crops and to do with plants, was fought over in the, in India. Um, it was a, a lot of Indian farmers were basically suing Monsa Monsanto, right, for essentially getting a farmer that lived in the middle of a group of other farmers that were surrounded by you know, farmers growing natural crops to grow. They got the one in the middle to grow GM crops. They're GM crops. 
knowing full well that when those crops were pollinating, they would also pollinate the surrounding area, yeah, the crops in the surrounding area. And Monsanto's argument was that they then belong to them. Yeah. Those crops, those natural, those formerly natural crops, because they were pollinated by the the um, the crops that were their product, yeah. Because it had, because those crops that were pollinated had had their products inside them, they then belonged to Monsanto. They were basically stealing their goods, their product. Naturally, this infuriated the farmers who were, who were surrounding this one field, and they took them to court. They took Pfizer to court, not Pfizer, sorry, Monsanto, and they lost. Monsanto won the case. It was basically deemed by by the Indian Indian courts that it was Monsanto's product from that point on irrespective of whether the pollination was done accidentally or without their knowledge those those crops still belong to Monsanto and these farmers lost everything this set a precedent right because they then could apply this to everything yeah people have turned around and said you get, it's impossible you cannot patent life can you not can you not well, why have, why have Pfizer, in the past, since 2005 alone, done 153 patents, yeah, of naturally biologically occurring organisms? The Cabardi case was one of the great judicial moments in world history, and the public was totally unaware it was actually happening as the process was being engaged. General Electric and a Professor Jack Abardi went to the patent office with a little microbe that eats up oil spills. They said they had modified this microbe in the laboratory and therefore it was an invention. The patent office, the US government, took a look at this quote invention and they said, no way. The patent statutes don't cover living things. This is not an invention. Turned down. Then General Electric and Dr. Jacobardi appealed to the US Customs Court of Appeal. And to everyone's surprise, by a three to two decision, they overrode the patent office. <laughs> said this microbe looks more like a detergent or a reagent than a horse or a honeybee. I laugh because they didn't understand basic biology. It looked like a chemical to them. Had it had an antenna or eyes or wings or legs, it would never have crossed their table and been patented. Then the patent office appealed. And what the public should realize now is the patent office was very clear that you can't patent life. My organization provided the main amicus curiae brief if you allow the patent on this microbe, we argue, it means that without any congressional guidance or public discussion, corporations will own the blueprints of life. When they made the decision, we lost by five to four, and Chief Justice Warren Burger said, sure, some of these are big issues, but we think this is a small decision. Seven years later, the US Patent Office issued a one-sentence decree. You can patent anything in the world that's alive except a full birth human being. You can't patent nature, can you not? Oh, believe me, you can. Believe me, you can. Which brings me to something else. Something more troubling. And that's an act that was passed about a month ago. 
in the UK. It's basically a genetic engineering act. And the the law surrounding it and they've <laughs> just amazingly deliberately left these sort of um, edicts in this law so vague that it can be applied to human beings so what well, if you notice, right, or if you've been paying attention, there's a lot going on at the minute, yeah, that they're trying to change and trying to bring in. Quite a lot of it goes against your human rights. It's that little pesky sort of roadblock in the way, you know what I mean? Hi, Dad. All right, that the stops sort of these people We'll be nice and call them people, but these people, from actually enacting what they want to want to enact and instilling on us what they want to instill, yeah, it's these pesky human rights. Now, if, say, for instance, we can make those people not be classed as human anymore. Those pesky human rights that are stopping you go straight out of the window. And because you're a product of a company, because they're a product of a company, they're free to do as they wish with it. Do you see the gravity of the situation now? So you people who willingly went into this are going to have a very rude awakening at some point, very soon, I believe, because they're ramping things up, I think you'll notice. Yeah? Thankfully, a lot of you are waking up to, the, to what's going on. Unfortunately, I'm not sure whether it's actually in time or not, or whether you're too late. But it's good to see so many of you catching on. They're going to try this again. And you can see the WHO positioning them on this already, right? With, with the bird flu, which is also pretty suspicious because 2021 the conservative government started changing all the laws surrounding avian flu yeah whilst no one was looking lots and lots of statutory, statutory instruments pertaining just to bird flu alone and how to deal with it now why would they do that eh? makes you wonder now all of a sudden they're getting human cases. Hmm. I no offence, but that's not bullshit, yeah. Thankfully, there's quite a few MPs that are now catching on thinking, oh shit, we don't want to go through with this. Yeah. It's a bit of a problem. And right, it is. Massive problem. Like I said, fortunately, they're catching on. In fact, it's become such, a, such an issue with, the, with them catching on that it's started to re be reported all over the place, not yeah. just in the UK. What? Hello. <laughs> not just in the UK either. I saw a Sky News Australia report the other day where they were talking about that. Like, hang on, it's in this. I think maybe we need to get on this and start trying to sort something out so we don't have to do it. No one wants this. People are starting to realise that this WHO treaty isn't what well, it's cracked up to be, and very likely the way they're going to bring in a world government, a one world government. Top down control. As soon as, they, as soon as they get the power, they will call a pandemic for 
any reason they want. It doesn't have to be medical. Stated in the treaty, in the amendments. It's, it's unbelievable, the stuff that they've put down in that, thinking, hoping, should I say, no one would notice. And thankfully, a lot of people are, are actually sitting down and reading the fucking thing, because they need to. It's crazy. The thing is, they've got every government running headlong into this. Saying, it's for your safety. When everyone knows full well it isn't. And you still seemingly got idiots that will still believe anything that comes out of the mainstream media or the government still. Still masking up, <laughs> alone in the car with the windows shut. Fucking idiot. Masks do nothing. Have you not been paying attention? Oh no, you haven't, no, because you're a retard, that's why. So, <clears throat> we need Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt out. Jeremy Hunt especially, we need gone. Because he's the linchpin that's driving it all. He's the one who's in control and, like, well, he's, I say in control, he's passing on the orders. No, thanks for that. <laughs> he's passing on the orders from his controllers. And Rishi's just been the usual dim-witted, lap dog self that he is so hunt needs to go Rishi needs to go in fact the whole the whole freaking parliament needs to go to be perfectly honest and we need to start from scratch but <sighs> we've got to make do with what we got for the moment until we can actually do that these past by elections have oh, been quite a quite an eye opener <laughs> right the vast majority of people have gone, no, nope, not interested, not playing your games anymore. And most MPs have noticed. If we had a party that basically ran on, we want all them out, we want all this reversed and sorted out, and with a solution of this is how we do it, people jump at it, jump at the chance to vote for them, for, to vote them in. And we see the very rapid dissolution of all the other parties. As they're left powerless. And we get other independents in. But anyway. So yeah, that's what's been going on. <coughs> been taking up quite a lot of my time, that and the epic series and the resident series as well. But my next fire post will be in quite a while. Off yet. Yeah. Whilst I uh, attempt to get through all these bloody documents and if you're watching Kate, Bob, give us a hand. Eh? <laughs> anyway, oh, like, oh, oh, share, oh. subscribe, what? I'm good. No, he's good. Okay. I. You know the drill. I'll see you later. Yeah, yeah.